My name is Leia Kutal. Today, I will be discussing digital dump sites and how they impact child health and well-being. This year, I had the chance to study the environmental effects of handling e-waste during AP Environmental Science. Given that over 18 million children across the world are engaged in this activity, I decided to more deeply explore e-waste, but now in the context of global health. Before we begin, here's some information about me. I am from Acton, Massachusetts, and I am a rising sophomore at Acton Boxborough Regional High School. In my free time, I enjoy writing, and I am a writing editor for my school's literary magazine. I also love to volunteer, and I am currently a member of the Teen Volunteer Program at the Discovery Science Museum. My interests lie in the overlaps of global health, the environmental sciences, and medicine, and I wish to pursue a career as a physician in the future. So now let us establish some background information on today's topic. First, what exactly is e-waste? Who essentially defines it as any electrical equipment and any of its components that become waste? This includes disposed items like batteries, ink cartridges, TVs, and phones. With these products in mind, what regions produce the most e-waste? You'll find in figure one that e-waste generation is most highly constituted by countries in the Americas, Europe, and Western Pacific. These countries are also represented by the red and green regions in map number one. All the same, lower income regions still produce a sizable amount of e-waste, and these graphics conjointly demonstrate that e-waste generation is more than just a local problem. So where do these megatons of e-waste end up? E-waste is mostly shipped to territories where e-waste regulations are less strict, including Africa, South Asia, and East Asia, regions which are highlighted in map number two. So what exactly makes this issue urgent? The Global E-Waste Monitor states that only 17.4% of global e-waste in 2019 was properly recycled. Additionally, e-waste is projected to grow to 75 million tons by 2030. Hand in hand with this alarming trend is a 70% increase in people handling hazardous waste, which means an additional 45 million people at risk for its harms by 2030. Returning to the focus of my presentation, why are children particularly at risk? It's important to highlight that the countries with the most e-waste dump sites also have the highest prevalence of child labor. Next, physiologically, children are smaller in size, have less developed organs, a faster growth rate, and are less able to metabolize hazardous substances. Finally, in a practical sense, children tend to spend more time closer to the ground and in proximity to e-waste. All of these factors make children more vulnerable to e-waste when they are exposed to it, which is what we are going to examine more closely in the following slides. Environmental pollution can lead to transport of chemicals through air, water, soil, and food contamination. Children can interact with these chemicals through occupation or from living in communities near e-waste sites. Primitive methods of taking apart e-waste, such as dumping, burning, leaching, and shredding, can expose children to toxic compounds, which include PCBs, mercury, chromium, and lead. So, figure four shows us common toxins released from e-waste frequently found at e-waste sites. On the other hand, figure four portrays types of pollution from different informal recycling activities. As an example, figure four tells us that the method of burning wiring circuit boards results in fumes and fly ash. And figure three tells us that the pollutants found in these emissions will be PCBs and lead. In addition to environmental exposure, we must address the four major physiological pathways of exposure. The primary route is ingestion, as anything from leachate from recycling or chemicals like cyanide used to extract metals can contaminate seafood, vegetables, and water that children consume on the regular. Inhalation exposes children to e-waste pollutants that are burned or heated, such as PCDFs or dioxins. Children are at a greater risk from inhalation because of their higher breathing rate than adults. To give you an idea, a five-year-old's breath rate is 20 to 27 breaths per minute, while an adult's is only 12 to 18. In e-waste communities in China, the daily intake of PCDDs and PCDFs in the air was estimated to be almost twice as high for children as for adults, according to a review by Environ International. We must also take into, the, into account the possibility of transplacental exposure. This occurs when pregnant women are exposed to toxicants, placing their fetus at risk during critical gestational windows. PCBs, zinc, and other chemicals can all cross through the placenta although there are gaps in our understanding of how the placenta might detoxify these compounds. Finally, dermal exposure refers to hazardous substances that are absorbed by the skin. It is common for lipophilic organic compounds to sit on the skin and enter the body when a child is injured by a sharp e-waste object. With these different exposure pathways in mind, we can now discuss the health impacts of e-waste on children. 
To begin with, neurological impacts can be summarized by increased rates of ADHD, behavioral problems, sensory integration difficulties, and reduced cognitive scores. All of these are primarily linked to lead exposure. Additionally, exposure to cadmium and persistent organic pollutants have been associated with impaired cognition. As for the immune system, a study by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health found that elevated levels of blood lead and zinc in Nigerian children were correlated with antibody titers below levels needed to fight infections like mumps, tetanus, and diphtheria. Fighting disease and cognitive abilities were not the only aspects of child health put into jeopardy. In a 2022 summary, WHO outlines that exposure to air pollution in early life has been associated with a range of respiratory effects, including acute lower respiratory infections, deficits in lung growth, and asthma development. Finally, cardiovascular health is also left in the balance. In one study of preschool children in Gayu, China, air pollution from e-waste recycling was linked to increased heart rate and norepinephrine, biomarkers of sympathoadrenomedullary function, which basically keeps your body in a state of homeostasis and maintains heart rate as a critical part of the stress system. So e-waste is the fastest growing domestic waste stream in the world, and yet it has not received the attention it warrants on research or health agendas. So now I'm going to shift our focus to how this matter fits into the bigger picture of global health and its goals. E-waste is embedded in a number of UN, UN Sustainable Development Goals, from child welfare to urban development, unfortunately reflecting how far-reaching this issue is. Nonetheless, it's key to take away that this can also put things in a more positive light. In WHO's Global Strategy on Health, Environment, and Climate Change, it calls for collaboration between the health, labor, industry, environment, and private sector in parallel with the fundamental goals of global health. This will ensure that health-oriented interventions are adopted every step of the way, from mindful manufacturing to safe disposal, disposal of electronics. So to conclude my presentation, I would like to leave you with this reminder. Despite the sweeping exposure pathways, child health effects, and urgent projections, the angles we can take to tackle e-waste are just as expansive. For each of which, interdisciplinary collaboration and attention in the world of global health and medicine is essential. This following slide shows all of the references I used for my project. And I would like to thank my family for helping me throughout the research process, the GHLC team for organizing this conference and giving me this opportunity, and everyone in the audience for tuning in today. Thank you for listening. Here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me in my email if you have any questions about what I talked about today. Thank you. Mm.